Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. True abundance, true prosperity really begins not in our pockets or in our checkbooks, but begins in our hearts, begins in our minds, begins in our consciousness. And we're going to be talking about what that looks like and what are some of the things that we can practice to help develop or to expand our prosperity consciousness. It truly isn't dependent, and I know this can be hard to hold on to at times, it truly isn't dependent upon what we have in the bank account, it's not dependent upon what the stock market is doing. Have you noticed how crazy it's been this year? There have been a lot of ups and downs and cycles and, and swings. It seems to me that the stock market is emotional more than anything else. But that's a whole other, whole other story. It's not dependent. A prosperity consciousness is not dependent upon something we have. And it really comes down to a core belief. And I think it comes down to this core belief. We either believe that we live in an opulent universe that is benevolent, or we do not. If we believe that we live in an opulent universe that is benevolent, then our whole attitude about abundance is going to be very different than if we believe that we live in a universe that is malevolent and is lacking. I mean, just look at nature. Look at how prolific nature is. We live in a universe that is abundant. It doesn't mean necessarily that we have the abundance we want, but the universe is a field, a different way of looking at it, a field of infinite possibility. And each and every one of us live and move and have our being within that same field of infinite possibility. We are not all benefiting from it to the same degree, and the degree to which we are either benefiting from it or not is largely linked to our attitudes and to our consciousness. And so it starts in the heart. It starts in the mind. Here are a couple of definitions I like, one of prosperity and one of poverty. Prosperity, the development of and use the development of and use of one's inner resources that results in contentment and fulfillment of one's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. The whole gamut, the whole gamut, the development, I like that, the development of, of and use of one's inner resources that results in contentment and the feeling of fulfillment. The word wealth to me is a beautiful word. It comes from the old, an old English word that means well-being. I think that's the true definition. Well-being, that's what we're looking for, I believe, more than anything else. Poverty is a failure to recognize and use one's inner resources. So again, it comes back to consciousness, does it not? Right back to consciousness. We can look at it this way. With every thought we think, with every decision we make, with every action we take, we are either expanding and building a consciousness of abundance, or we are building a consciousness of lack. Do you know anyone who lives in a consciousness of lack? Nod your head if you know anyone who lives in a consciousness of lack. Do you know people who live in a consciousness of abundance? Yes. Who do you prefer to be with? <laughs> Pretty easy, probably, right? To be with somebody that lives in a consciousness of abundance. If they live in a consciousness of abundance, I promise you they're living in a consciousness also of faith, of believing somehow, some way, as long as they're doing their part, they're going to tr uh, attract to themselves, draw to themselves abundance, not just of money, but abundance of good things, the things and the experiences that make life fulfilling and rewarding. 
Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but in the Bible, there are more references and stories and examples and scripture verses related to giving and to what we would call abundance than there are to the topics of faith and love. Did you know that? There are. I, I venture to say that the reason for that is that people then, just as many today, still struggle with this topic. And therefore, the sages, the prophets, the wise men and women of those days were attempting to teach where there was the greatest need. The greatest need. Jesus taught many times about the principles of abundance. And one of my favorite, favorite stories is the parable of the talents. Do you remember the parable of the talents? Some of you do. I used to think when I was first going to church and first heard the idea of a talent, I thought that a talent was like somebody who could sing or somebody who could do something really well. How many of you thought or think that's what a talent is? But it wasn't. Do you know what a talent was? It was a measure of money. And a single talent, it is said by people who study these things, Bible scholars, that a single talent, one single talent, was the equivalent of a, the wages that a laborer, an average laborer, would earn over 15 years. Take that in for a moment. That's a lot of money, right? That's a lot of money. So in the parable of the talents, we, Jesus is telling a story of a master, of a person who had quite a bit of wealth, who was leaving and was entrusting some of his wealth to his servants. And to one servant, the parable says, that servant was given five talents. To another servant, that servant was given two. And to another servant, that servant was given one. And the master went off on a journey, and then the master came back. And the master wanted a, a reckoning, a reconciling of what happened to my money. And we're told in the parable that the servants that were given the five talents and the two talents, do you remember what they did with it? They went and they used it. They circulated it. They invested it. And they doubled it. How do you think the master felt about that? Well, okay, come on, guys. The master probably felt really good, right? A doubling? We don't know how long he was gone, but doubling a rate of return is not a bad, a bad rate of return. But the, the servant who was given the one talent, do you remember what he did with it? He buried it. I mean, we could just stop there, right? I mean, isn't it such a vivid? Jesus was a master teacher, a master teacher. The people he was speaking to could clearly get what the story was about. Here we have the two servants who were given the five talents and the two talents. And they took it and they did something with it. And in doing something with it, they multiplied it. And the, the master was very pleased with it. There's a whole metaphysical journey we could take on what the five talents mean and the two talents mean. That's a whole other lesson. But for this part of the message this morning, what we're being, what Jesus is pointing to is the difference between taking whatever it is we've been entrusted with and using it to the best of our ability and in the using of it to the best of our ability, it cannot help but expand and grow. And that we are not to take whatever it is that we have and hide it. Why do we usually hide things? Out of fear, right? And when the master asked the servant who had been, taken the, been given the one talent why he hid it, the servant said, because I, I, I understand that you are a pretty tough master, and I was afraid, and I wanted to at least give you what you gave me back. And if you remember the story, the master was not too happy about that, not too happy at all, and took away the little he had been given. Such richness, and I don't mean that in a prosperity sense right now, such richness in that story that we each are given something to work with in our lives. And more than just one something, we each are incredibly talented. And that is true regardless of our age, regardless of our gender, regardless of our background. We are talented by virtue of the fact that we are made in the image and after the likeness of God. In the image and after the likeness of God, you have talents that you are currently using 
that you could use even more. The same is true of me. You have talents that you're not using, and maybe you haven't even really fully unpacked them and discovered them. But the key to creating a life that is more abundant by whatever that means to you is by understanding what Jesus is getting at in these, this parable of the talents. That you have something, you already do, and that the very worst thing you could do with it is do nothing at all. So here are five ideas I want to share with you. The very first one is this, that we are to start where we are and work with our attitude. Start where I am and work with my attitude. Say that with me. Start where I am and work with my attitude. Turn to your neighbor and share that statement with him. Go ahead. Let me hear you. You kind of have to start where you are, right? I mean, we might want to start somewhere else, and we usually do. We don't want to start where we are because we don't usually like where we are. We've got that divine discontent thing going, and we want to be somewhere else. But just like Socrates said to the man who was trying to journey to Mount Olympus and was getting tired, and the man said to Socrates, he didn't know at first it was Socrates, how do, what's the shortcut? And Socrates said, there is no shortcut. Just make every step you take, take you in that direction. The same is true of us. We start where we are, we start where we are, and we work with our attitude. I remember when I was founding the church and literally had no money, no people, and, and like nothing. First Sunday, 87 people. The second Sunday, 14 people. I figured, doing the math, I was going to be out of business. We weren't going to be here after Sunday three or four, but that was not true. Math is not always, always accurate. But I can remember in the early days having to do, I guess, the same thing Myrtle was talking about, work at the level of not losing my faith. And part of it included the, the attitude I had about any of the bills I had to pay. Boy, I wish I had only those bills to pay now. <laughs> you know, only $25 a week to rent the Hotel La Jolla and, and stuff like that. But I can remember, both for personal checks and things that I had to pay for personally, and things that we paid for with the church, writing on every check. I know people don't usually use checks very much anymore today, but writing on every check, it's a pleasure to pay to the order of. Some of those checks, it was really easy to write, it's a pleasure to pay to the order of. And some of those, it was kind of hard. But you know what? The ones that I had the most resistant toward writing those words were the ones where I had the greatest work, inner work that I needed to do to realize that I was, or the church was receiving something of value that we had decided we needed, that it, that it was a, an exchange. And that if I was going to have to pay for it anyway, I might as well learn to pay for it with an attitude that was going to help me build a consciousness of abundance rather than one of fear and lack. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Another piece of working with attitude around our, what we have, I remember a ministerial colleague of mine, Edwin Gaines. Many of you in this room recognize the name Edwin Gaines, Unity Minister. She was in ministerial school one year before me, so we were there for an overlapping year. And I can remember Edwin talking about an aspect of developing a prosperity consciousness and the attitude of it. She said, you gotta work and look at how you look at people who have what you'd like to have. If you look at them with the attitude, they must have cheated to get it, or they don't deserve it, or I work harder than they do, or I'm jealous or envious of it. Do you think the universe is gonna wanna bless you with the same thing? Probably not, probably not. And she said, I remember her saying, and you know, it doesn't even matter how they got it as far as you are concerned. That's not your business. Look at how you look at those, whether we're talking about abundance or whether we're talking about health or we're talking about beautiful relationships with a significant other. Look at those who are modeling what you'd like to model and learn from and let it inspire you toward what is possible rather than 
somehow thinking they must have done something wrong to get where they are. Does that make sense? It takes a little bit of inner work for some of us. Second, value what you have. Remembering that what you value, what you appreciate does what? Appreciates or multiplies. So you've got to value what you already have. I remember this quote I learned decades ago that Rockefeller had said. It isn't what you do, it isn't what you should do if a million should be your lot, but what are you going to do with a dollar and a quarter you've got? <laughs> right? It's like we can think and plan and say, oh, when I have this, whatever this is, then I will give, or then I will do this, or then I will do that. But that's kind of backwards wisdom. The consciousness wisdom says, let me value what I have right now. And let me use what I have, whatever that is, wisely right now. Remember when Jesus fed the multitudes? The little boy presented him with a few fish and, and a few loaves of bread. The crowds were hungry. The disciples' answer to the problem was, send them away. They're hungry, send them away. And Jesus said, no, what do we have? How can we feed them? And that question brought forth a little bit. And in the story, we're told, I, you know, I think of Jesus and I think of myself. I probably would have looked at it and said, you want me to do what with this? You want me to feed this multitude with this amount? But we're told that wasn't the attitude. The attitude was appreciation for what was brought forth. We never know when we are in the flow of the attitude and consciousness of appreciation what else that will draw forth from the universe or from those around us to appreciate what we already have. There's a, 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 supposedly a true story of Warren Buffett. Everybody recognizes that name, right? Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett was in an elevator going uh, to uh, one of his offices or an, uh, to an office. And he was in this elevator with other executives. And he noticed on the floor of an el the elevator a penny. Now, we're talking Warren Buffett here, OK? And the story is he bent down and he picked up the penny. None of the other executives who, who saw the same penny did what he did. And as he got off the elevator, he holds it up and he says, the beginning of my next billion dollars. <laughs> what is that saying? To me, it's saying, valuing, appreciating whatever you do have. And appreciating it even more if you don't think it's enough. Because I'll tell you, the quickest way to have it become even less is to have an attitude of lack about it. Third is to circulate, to circulate whatever it is that you want to receive. People like to say, well, I'm going to just circulate my time and get money for it. No, that's not quite the way the universe works. It's like you don't plant a tomato seed and expect to get potatoes. It just doesn't work that way. You circulate whatever it is that you want to receive. If you need more time in your life, then be generous with the time you have. If you need more fi finances in your life, circulate that. There's no loophole in the universe. You can spend all your time trying to find it but you're gonna spend all your time trying to find it and you're just not going to. Circulate what it is that you want to receive. How many of you have ever heard this piece, and if you have, I'm gonna share it with you again, called The Two Seas in Palestine? It's a lovely piece, it's written by Bruce Barton. There are two seas in Palestine. One is fresh and fish are in it. Splashes of green adorn its banks. Trees spread their branches over it and stretch out their thirsty roots to sip of its healing waters. The River Jordan makes this sea with sparkling water from the hills. So it laughs in the sunshine, and men build their houses near to it and birds their nests. And every kind of life is happier there because it is there. The River Jordan flows on out into another sea. Here there is no splash of fish, no fluttering leaf, no song of birds, no children's laughter. Travelers choose another route and less unurgent business. The air hangs heavy above its water, and neither man nor beast nor fowl will drink of it. What makes this mighty difference in these neighboring seas? Not the River Jordan. 
It empties the same good water into both, not the soil in which they lie, not in the country round about. This is the difference. The Sea of Galilee receives but does not keep the River Jordan. For every drop that flows into it, another drop flows out. The giving and receiving go on in equal measure. The other sea is shrewder, hoarding its income jealously. It will not be tempted into any generous impulse. Every drop it gets, it keeps. The Sea of Galilee gives and lives. The other sea gives nothing. It is named the Dead Sea. There are two kinds of people in this world circulating what you want to receive. Ministers and I have talked about this often. When offerings are collected in church, there's an interesting thing that happens. Dollar bills are the most crumpled bill that's ever put into the basket, except when the minister points it out on that particular Sunday. <laughs> Fives are sometimes crumpled nowadays too, and maybe, maybe a 10. Never, ever, except on a Sunday like this perhaps, does a minister ever see a crumpled $100 bill. <laughs> truly, truly, what is it saying? We, we say something, not, in, not just in what we give, but in how we give what we give. Fourth, give some of the good stuff, not just the leftovers. Oh, man. Oh, man. Give some of the good stuff, not just the leftovers. Years ago, I remember learning about Chinese farmers and their potato crops. When they were first cultivating their potatoes, the Chinese farmers thought, we're going to harvest and keep the biggest, best potatoes. Makes sense on, on one hand, doesn't it? Why would you not want the biggest and best to enjoy? But that's a very short-lived attitude, because what do you suppose happened to the farmers over generations of planting harvesting and keeping and consuming the biggest and best potatoes. What do you think happened to the crops over the years? They reduced the size of their potatoes to marbles. It's the idea of what happens when we hold back the best. And sometimes we do it, a lot of times I think we do it out of fear. Sometimes we also do it out of, well, they don't deserve my best. It could be true. We do this in a work environment. Many people do. They will, will withhold the best of their talents, the best of their ideas, the best of their energy, because maybe they have been burned by their employer. Maybe they have not been appreciated by their employer or compensated fairly by their employer. And so they think, I'm just, I'm going to withhold. I'm not going to give my biggest and my best. What happens is we begin to wither inside. We begin to lose our the best that we have to offer. We are meant to give the best that we can, not because they necessarily deserve it or not, but because who deserves the reward for consistently giving our best? You don't know? We do. We do. You and I are the ones that benefit when we give our best. When we give our best, we do need to keep our eyes open, too, because if we are in a place, in a relationship, or in a work environment, we're truly, we're not being compensated or appreciated for what it is we are doing when we are giving our best. We need to keep our eyes open and our ears open because either the environment will change, and sometimes it does, or we will earn the right to be somewhere else where we are justly and generously compensated. So it all comes back to the investment we are making in ourselves. So giving some of the good stuff, not just our leftovers. Jesus said, give good measure, press down, shaken together, running over. Not skimpily. And the last, so breathe, is to relax and to let go a bit and to trust. To relax and to let go a bit and to trust. When you write your checks out for your bills or however you pay, practice relaxing a bit. 
practice appreciating the fact that you can pay, even if it's not everything you owe, if you're in debt, appreciate the step toward getting out of debt that you're taking. Work at the level of your consciousness and your attitude. Relax a little bit when you give, when you give here. Give consciously, whatever it is you choose to give. Give it consciously. Don't give it like this. It really doesn't impact us on the receiving end as much as it impacts you on the giving end. Give it this way. In fact, do this with me right now. Hold your hands like this, okay? And just relax. Whatever it is, in whatever way you're going to give, and I'm not just talking here, but in your life, to give with that kind of feeling. And so let me close quickly with just a recap here. First idea, start where you are and work with your attitude first. The second, value what you have, remembering that what you appreciate, appreciates. The third was to circulate, to use whatever it is you want to receive. If you need money, you better learn how to give it. Bottom line, if you need time, you better learn how to use it wisely and share it. Fourth, give some of the good stuff, not just the leftovers, not just the leftovers. And to the best of your ability, whatever it is you are giving, wherever you are giving, practice relaxing a bit, letting go, and trusting. Namaste. Namaste.